Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue on in our look at, our look through, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, letter to the Ephesians. And as I mentioned a few other times, one of the things that, this is not specifically, uh, we're going through it in detail, but it's not particularly just to look at what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Mm -hmm. It's about getting into the Word of God. Scripture interprets Scripture. Yes. That's how you know you're on track. So we use this as a place to go through and go into it in depth, just so that we can see more and more about the Word. Because our goal is to see Jesus Christ more clearly. And the goal of our instruction is, as Paul said, love. Yeah. Hallelujah. And getting to know him better. Getting to know him better. Getting to know him better. That's going to be important in this one, I think. Mm -hmm. So, Mark, you want to open our time with a prayer? Oh, Lord, we just thank you for your word and just open it to our hearts and minds so we can just spread it to others. Amen. 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 To our hearts and minds. Awesome. Starting with the hearts. Hallelujah. Right, I'm going to read uh, Ephesians 1, 15 through 17. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him. Right? For this reason, you know, everything has a reason. Okay, God made everything with a purpose. God has a reason for everything that he does. And the reason that Paul is speaking of here is their faith and their love. Right? Yes. Because he heard of their faith and their love. All right? Mm -hmm. So it's important to note and come to understand that what he is speaking of is the breastplate that protects our hearts the core of our being. Because writing to the church here, at towards the ending of this letter, Paul writes, I'm going to read from chapter 6, verses 13 through 17, right? Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take up the helmet, take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Right? Now that's the whole armor of God. I'm sure you I pray that you're familiar with that. But when Paul wrote to the church of the Thessalonians, he said, But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.8. So there's no contradiction here. Okay, Paul didn't change his mind between this letter to the Ephesians and the letter that he wrote to the Thessalonians. Okay? Mm -hmm. Our righteousness, which is the free gift of God, right? and that's what we just looked at last week, it's made evident in, it results in faith and love. Righteousness is the equivalent. He's saying the breastplate, in one, he says, is faith and love, and one, the other one, he says, is righteousness. That's because faith and love combined is righteousness. Okay, is that fairly clear, right? You know, the Apostle Paul, he summed that up, and uh, I think Mark was talking about this recently in 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul is talking about love. Love is, right? And he talks about if I do all these things, if I give everything, but don't have love. If I have all this faith, but don't have love, it profits nothing, um, but a clanging symbol, right? Mm -hmm. Faith and love have to go together. They have to go together. Faith is what what happens when you are motivated by God's love, right? 
So, but, but understand that, and that there's no contradiction there between Thessalonians and Ephesians. So they're just interchangeable. Mm -hmm. So he goes on and he says, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you. What's that? This is about their testimony. Their faith in Jesus was evident to the people around them. It was evident to Paul, right? He had heard about them. There's no secret Christians there. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, is your faith in Jesus evident? Is it noticeable? The people see your faith in Jesus. See, it's not about the fabulous buildings or the great choir or the pastor that a congregation of believers has, but it's about their trust in the faithfulness of the Lord. That trust is only made evident in the actions that put us at risk in the natural. Faith is always about risk. Why? Because it's, it's operating not based on what you can see, but what you've heard from God. And when you're closing your eyes, choosing to not go by sight, but to go by faith, you don't think that involves risk? Maybe you haven't spent enough time reading about the early church. Righteousness is relationship. Right? Our, righteousness is about our relationship with God the Father, right. which was purchased by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. But if, if you have faith in somebody, you would have a relationship. Because you'd be trusting that person. Well, you can't have faith in somebody that you don't have a relationship oh, with. Yeah. Or you'd be foolish to. You know, Jeremiah wrote, or God spoke to Jeremiah in chapter 17 of uh, his, his letter, his book. That cursed is a man who trusts in mankind. But how blessed is the man who trusts in, in, in God, right? So you have good cause to trust in the Lord God. Because that's a love relationship and you know that he loves you. How do you know that he loves you? He proved it. I mean, go think about what Paul said in Romans chapter 8. He said, if God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, and he put Jesus Christ, the perfect man, his, his, his only begotten son, on the cross to pay for us, and we were purchased with a price, what good thing would he withhold from you? He proved his love. His love is evident. I was just thinking about the fact that if you, you have a relationship of the world, then you, you're putting your trust in them. The fact, yeah, I understand what you're saying. The fact is, I don't believe anybody actually has a relationship. It's all, it's all hype. It's all uh, short, smoke yours. and mirrors. It, no, it's all smoke and mirrors. It's, you know, if you put your trust in the world, you, 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 you've been foolish because the world will fail you. That's a simple That's truth. Absolutely. Fair. But the fact of the matter is, if you put your trust in the word, the word never fails. Never, ever. Love never fails. And his, yes. his, his, Jesus, who is the Word, is love. is love, right? So you you have to come to that place where you have a well, for this reason. You have to know the reason that you can trust in God. Right. He has demonstrated His love, and then the question becomes: Are we demonstrating our love for Him? Right. Is it evident? Are people hearing about it? Paul's talking about here. He heard about the faith. About the, you know the faithfulness of the church, the people, the congregation at Ephesus. How? How do you think you heard of that? Because it was evident the things they were doing were being spoken of. Right, people were talking about it. People were talking about it. And I promise you. And you know what? It's not necessarily a good testimony when the world talks about it because they may very well hate you, mm -hmm. but they'll still be talking about it. And when a believer like Paul hears about it. He's going to appraise it spiritually because we're supposed to appraise all things spiritually. Yes. And you'll know. You know, the, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, we talked about this a lot, that is the core teaching of Christianity. Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. It's not about your good works. But it's about the fact that what you do, motivated by your faith and love, will give evidence in your trust in God, mm -hmm. your faith in God. Faith but see, it's, that's not about people seeing what you've done. A testimony is about people seeing what God has done in you and through you. That's what a testimony is supposed to be. It's not about you. It's about the God 
It's all about him. Yeah. Everything is about God. So, so then he goes on to say, here in this verse, making mention of you in my prayers. Now I want to tell you something. When you're being faithful, when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, serving the Lord and blessing others, I promise you, the Lord will have somebody praying for you. Yes. Right? Paul was praying for these people in the church. Now, so I think we talk, treat prayer in a very loose, light, and trite manner sometimes. I'll pray for you. No, no. Mm. When Paul said he was praying for them, he was praying for them. All right? One, you know, pops into my mind thinking about people praying for you. Mm -hmm. Have you you've heard of Gaius? Yes. You've heard of Gaius in the New Testament? Well, John, in his third letter, in the first, first three verses of the first chapter, John wrote, To the elder, the elder, that's him, mm -hmm. to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. Mm. See, I'll tell you what. People are going to be talking about you. If you're, walking, if you're living in faith, if you're living, you, people are going to talk about you. One way or the other. But word gets around, I, I promise you. It popped in my head is in the book of Acts. When uh, you know the the account of the seven sons of Sceva, oh, yes, yeah. they they were Demons. I mean the spirit of God was moving powerfully <clears throat> in the church and in the church people demons were being cast out prophecies were being done and these seven sons of Sceva who was a priest mm -hmm. who were not part of the church and who were not spirit filled they went and they tried to cast out a demon they said you know they're trying to cast this demon out in the name of Jesus and the demon said to them. Jesus I know, Paul I know about, but who are you? And then proceeded to beat beat them up bad, all right? How did they know about Paul? Because they heard about him. How did they hear about him? I'm going to tell you how I think they heard about him. The, the other demons, no, I think the other demons were running around saying, oh, boy, if you, if you run across that, uh, that apostle Paul, you better watch out. Is that not reasonable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They had, and he had them shaken in their boots. He did. Because he was moving in the spirit of God, in the love of God, and in the faith of God. The confidence. Of God Absolutely. Well. So, yeah, I, th I think, you know, people need to know your relationship with God. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to be hidden. We're supposed to be proclaiming what God has taught us and shown us from the, from the rooftops, all right? You know, years ago, uh, I was I was doing... I think I did a, a week long in, up in, in New York, right outside New York City. I did a week long teaching every every night. We're having, I guess, like they call them revival meetings. And I was speaking each night. And uh, at the end of one of the nights, I think towards the end of the time that I was there, a woman came up to Alice. Oh, right, yes. And said to me, said to her, well, well you, you yeah, tell me, because yeah. I, they, they, I only got this second yeah. hand. She said that she um, found out that night at the revival, she said God spoke to her and said to her, this is the butch you've been praying for, I've had you praying for. So she said she'd been praying for him every morning at 5 a.m. because God told her to pray for butch. And she never knew who he that's was. That's my nickname, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and then she came to this revival, and God spoke to her and said, "This is who I've had you praying for." So she had been praying for me for a couple of years. Yeah, didn't yeah. even know me, but didn't God had put it on her heart to pray, pray for me. But He finally yeah. let she her meet. Show her, yes. Yeah, let her meet who she'd been praying for. Yeah. <laughs> Does God ever talk to you about what's going on with other people? You know, I, I'm. I'm I would think that you probably heard about the accident that I had when we were living down in doing missionary work and living in Belize, Central America. Mm. And I, I was hit by a speeding semi truck. Uh, I was on foot and I was hit by a truck. And they, the, the truck then hit our vehicle, which Alice was, was sitting in, demolished that. We found out later that 
the night before the accident, night before the accident, God had awakened a woman from the congregation that I had pastored up in central Florida and told her to pray for peace for Alice. The night before the accident. Do you think God doesn't know what's going on? He knows what's going on before it happens. Before we even know it. Be before we can think before or ask, ask, he, he is does. already making provision. He does, yeah. And believe me, I have peace. That past That's understanding. understanding. Amen. Yeah. All right. So trust that God has his eyes fixed on you. And you have your eyes fixed on his son, Jesus Christ. So he goes on in that, in that verse, <clears throat> those verses, and says, The spirit of wisdom and of revelation and in the knowledge of him. You know, wisdom is such an incredibly important word. And yet, generally, it's so misunderstood. A dictionary will tell you that to be wise is to judge properly what is true or right. Well, how can you know what's true or right if you don't know him who is the truth? And you cannot know Jesus, him, Jesus, without a revelation of him. Right? So you've got to have that revelation to get that wisdom. But now is the time for us to focus on the knowledge of the revealed fact that there are two types of wisdom at play in mankind. One is good and one is evil. One is from the world and one is from the word. In the world, well, James wrote, James 3.15, and he said, the wisdom that the world has, right? This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. That's one type of wisdom, three adjectives, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're not getting if you're getting your wisdom from the world, you're getting wisdom that certainly you know it's earthly, but it's also and it's natural, but it's also demonic. But if your wisdom is coming from the word, it says in James 3.17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. So you need James, James 3.17. The first one was from James 3.15. So the point is, we're told, if you go from Proverbs, if you ever read Proverbs, you see that we're supposed to be seeking wisdom and understanding all the time, right? Mm -hmm. But you need to know where you're seeking the wisdom from. You don't want worldly wisdom. No. Well, why? Why? So where, where are the origins of wisdom? Where does wisdom come from? Thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs nine ten. So it's the fear of the Lord, holding God in awe, knowing that His Word is holy and pure. I mean, knowing the, the greatness of our God. That's where wisdom starts. That would, of course, be godly wisdom from above. Worldly wisdom has roots in what we are specifically warned against in Proverbs. Lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5. That's where worldly wisdom comes from. Leaning on your own understanding. Or somebody else's in the world. Their understanding. Right? The wisdom that is earthly, natural, and demonic is all that the world has to offer. Because they've rejected Jesus Christ. And they have excommunicated him from the educational system. In fact, there was a news article I read yesterday that a teacher in some school, I didn't pay a lot of attention to it, but uh, a couple of children were talking about how they now had, they had been adopted, they had uh, oh. two daddies. Oh. And this teacher, obviously a Christian, made mention of the fact, he said that homosexuality is a sin. He was immediately removed and fired. It's amazing. Don't don't think. It's amazing. You know, I, I want to speak to the parents and say I don't understand. You know, the fact is I do understand. The problem is that maybe you don't understand. Children should not be in those public schools. Government schools. Government schools. Yeah. They should not be in those government schools. Okay. In most, in the government schools for years and years and years now in the United States of America, Jesus Christ has been barred from the public school system. It's like the church at Laodicea. He's locked yeah, out. He's locked out. Unless, of course, 
you're using that name as a curse. Mm -hmm. That name, which is above all names, the only name given by which men can be saved. If you're using that name of Jesus as a curse, you are protected by the government and told about the right that you have to do it. Right. If, however, you're using as it should be used, In conversation, that's against prayer. the law, which is prayer. You're not allowed to do that. All right. So, I don't know. The schools, the school systems, this uh, sounds like I'm on a rant now. I can get on a rant about this very easily, by the way. Jeremiah says, God speaks through Jeremiah, because it's God saying, do not learn the ways of the world. Don't, right? Don't learn the ways of the nations, the world. The, don't learn those ways. The King James says heathen. Well, that's unbelievers, right? What else can the world teach you? What else can the government if, if the teaching of Jesus Christ, the word of God, is not allowed in the school, what else can they teach you other than the ways of the world? That's all I know. Mommy and daddy, daddy and mommy, you're going to have to answer to God for the children he has entrusted you with. That's the world's educational system, anywhere in the world, any place in the world, where the focus of the program is not God, Jesus, and the word, which is pretty much all government systems, right? Mm -hmm. And is not seeking the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, will be, will be producing after its own kinds. And they will produce a natural man with no supernatural connection. Right? Mm -hmm. Now consider the words of Paul in his message to the Corinthians. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 14. Right? Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God for their foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Now take a look at what's going on in the world around us. What's happening in the world. The proof is in the pudding. I mean, look at the culture. I'm, you know, we, Alice and I, we just came back recently from England. The culture there is like the culture here in the United States of America. I, you know, when Alice and I were first married, there was a television channel in New York City where we lived in, in New York. And this channel, every night at 10 o'clock, they would say, it's 10 mm. o'clock, do you know where your children are? Yes, I remember that, yeah. Every night. Do you always know where your children are? you know what your children are doing? Do you know how prevalent suicide is among children in the United States of America? Why? Mm. Okay. Another horror. Okay. So now, the goal of this, it says, is the knowledge of Him. Our goal is not supposed to be about to know about God, but to know God, to know Him. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not about knowing about Him. Do you not think that Facebook has had a spiritual effect on uh, the world? Everybody that's got thousands of friends and they don't know a single one. Not a single one. Right? They don't know. Oh, they may know about them. They may know a little bit, of, but they don't know them. To know somebody is an intimate knowledge. You need to be part of them, all right? You know, there are three of us sitting here, but there's only one body sitting here. Mm -hmm. There's only one body. I can tell you things about Mark that Mark probably wouldn't even want me to tell you about. <laughs> and I know for a fact, well, I'm never going to go. Vice versa, too. Vice versa. Vice versa. <laughs> but the, the thing is, we know each other. And we have an intimate knowledge. Why? Because we, we have prayed together. We have played together. We have, together. Yeah, absolutely. We've lived together. Remember, Scripture interprets Scripture. So I'm going to tell you how you can know God. Ta-da. You might want to write this down. You might want to write a lot of this stuff down, if for no other reason than to check me out and make sure I'm not kidding you. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 7 through 10. Paul writes, 
But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. There is a gigantic, there's a, a, such a difference between knowing about somebody and knowing somebody. <clears throat> and you know what? There's a cost. To pay, there's a price to be paid to know somebody. Because you're never going to really know somebody unless you have made yourself vulnerable and let them know you. The world loves the dark, to hide. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't want to be known. They don't. They don't want you to know all about well, them. That's why, with these huge mega churches, people go to them so they can be hidden. That's one of the reasons that they do. A lot of times, I mean. You know, I've pastored a couple of churches that were, I'll, I'll say, I'll say small. I mean, and if somebody, I knew the people. It says, you know, that the shepherd should know well the condition of his flock. Yes. So I knew the people. I mean, I knew, knew the people. And the people knew me. We spent time with them. We spent time with them. We were, were part of one another's lives. Same. It wasn't, was you it? know, it wasn't an hour on once a week. No, no. Our lives were all through the week. Enjoyed. All through, yes. So, if somebody was doing something that they shouldn't have been doing, then I, as the shepherd, I would go to them in love and deal with it, right? And they would have choices. And the choices would be, well, if you're doing something wrong, you change it. Or you can turn and run and go hide. You ever see a sick puppy? That's the yes. person, they, they, they are not just sick. sick. But when they do something wrong. Yeah, they do something wrong. Yeah, they go high. Immediately let you know. <laughs> well, the nice thing is they can stay and still be Christians and still talk about what good Christians they are by going into a megachurch with a thousand, two thousand, three thousand people. And they don't know, know each other. Because nobody's going to know them. We actually knew, or we didn't know them, but we met two pastors who were pastors in the same, same church, church. And they didn't know each other. They never they, even met. They didn't know each other. Yeah. So, you know, make sure you're not going to a church so big that you're hiding. And remember this, you can't hide from God. No. You can hide from people, but you can't hide from God. I, I'm just going to just start this. We're not going to get into it now. In the, in the 18th verse, Ephesians 1.18, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance of his, in his saints. Did you know your heart has eyes? Yes. Well, we're going to talk about that when we come back next week. Because that's really, really cool and really, really important. Yes, it's you're supposed to good. see. You're supposed to see with your heart. That's right. I did seminars for years, and one of the things that was a key to the seminars I did, I talked about vision. You know, it says in Proverbs, where there's no vision, the people perish. Mm -hmm. But vision is the ability to see with your heart what you can't see with your eyes. Faith is not about what you see with your eyes. Faith is about what you see with your heart. Because with the heart, man believes. So, Father, I thank you, Lord God, that the heart that you've given us, a heart of flesh, you took away the heart of stone. Lord, that you are filling that. You're pouring into our hearts your love, your word, Lord, that we might be faithful witnesses to your to your love for people. Lord, just, just help us to grow closer and closer to you. Help us to know you better than we do. Help us, Lord, to desire you. In Jesus' name I pray, Father. Well, God bless you and goodbye until next time. Love you. See you then. Wonders
Love your mind.